with me, if you will, to the book of Revelation. Tonight, the Lord willing, we are looking at the church at Philadelphia, part one. We're in Revelation chapter three, verses seven through 13. Last week, of course, I was supposed to preach this message, except, as you know, I was sick. And thank you so much to Brother Keith McCoy, who preached in my stead last week. So tonight, we're church number six, June 10th, 2018, the Church of Philadelphia, part one. So it's right across the river from us here, and if you just hunt long enough, maybe you will find this church. Beginning in verse seven. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Just remember that. He not only knows the works of this church, but he knows the works of each one of us. And he knows the crummy excuses that we make for what we do. Ah, that he would say this to us. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar, pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that tonight you would give us seeing eyes and hearing ears, that we might hear what the Spirit says unto Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood. We thank you, Father, for your word and for its power, for its beauty and for its grace, for its clarity, for its precision, for its penetrating observation of our hearts, for its challenge and for its call to obedience. We pray, Father, for your blessing upon the word of God tonight as it goes forth, that it would indeed not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> last, two weeks ago, not last week, but the week before. Let me just make sure this is on. It is, okay. Two weeks ago, we talked about the church at Sardis, part two. And we noted that if somebody wanted to make a ghoulish horror movie about Sardis, they could name it the Church of the Living Dead, or religious zombies from the past, or this place used to smell sweet, but now it stinks. Sardis, a place where there were only a few people who were holding forth the truth by the way in which they preached and the way in which they lived. It was a church that had a good name, but in fact, it was dead. It was like a preserved mummy. It looked like the original, but spiritually, it never moved. 
But there were a few, that's a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So we noted that even a grotesquely dead church can still have a faithful remnant like Sardis had. And uh, I mentioned how many times as you drive through the south, you often see a, a church in some small rural village somewhere called Sardis Baptist Church, and I, I can't imagine naming a church after that, but it was a church where there is no persecution. It was a church that thought they had it all. Of course, the devil's not gonna persecute a dead church. That's like beating a dead horse. Nothing gonna happen from that. It was a very wealthy city. It was a city that produced beautiful clothing and what they needed was white clothing at Sardis. They shall not defile their garments. They shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. How important it is, and we'll learn something about clothing again tonight too, but how important it is that we have clothing that is pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in America today, we are very much seduced by the culture around us into wearing the kind of clothing that is not holy clothing. Clothing that reveals intimate parts of the body which should not be revealed. Clothing that reflects the dirty styles of the world. Clothing that we pay hundreds of dollars for, or at least some people do, that already has to holes torn in it and all kinds of stains deliberately placed on the clothing. But the holy clothing that's described for us here is reflective of Revelation chapter 19 where we find the bride of Christ in holy white. That's the beauty that God gives to us of clothing here as he contrasts it with Sardis. Sardis was the place where Aesop wrote his many Greek fables. It was a city of literary genius. It was a city of wealth but it was a place where the church was dead. We talked about the remnant principle last time. There were a few, a remnant at Sardis who did not follow the wealthy sloth of the majority and Jesus singles them out for special praise. The remnant principle is seen very frequently throughout the Bible. God may let a culture slide, but he always keeps a few of his elect living holy lives, even in the middle of a corrupt Society, I trust that some here fall into that category. Noah and his family are an illustration of the remnant principle. Abraham is an illustration of the remnant principle. Joseph in Egypt is an illustration of the isolated faithful man who had every rational motive for compromise, but he refused. God always has a faithful remnant, even in times of greatest worldliness, in times of compromise and apostasy and internal rot in the church and lackadaisical laziness. That characterizes some folks here in this church. It doesn't matter whether or not you show up for church. After all, you can yawn and ho-hum and, you know, go on and watch it over the internet after all. That's Laodicea. We'll get there. But God does have a remnant. And the question is, are you one of the faithful remnant or do you merely think you're one of the remnant? Because it's very easy to deceive yourselves if you have no commitment. Paul talks about the remnant principle in Romans 11. We read that last week, verses 1 through 5. God said to Elijah, who thought he was all by himself, he says, I've reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. And then Paul adds about the church of Rome, he says, even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And it may be a larger remnant than you anticipate. But remember, the remnant is there, but also remember something else. The tares can outnumber the wheat. But you know what's going to happen at time of harvest? When God harvests, and what does he tell the angels to do? He says, they said, hey, there's a bunch of tares in here. He says, that's all right. Go ahead, cut everything down, and then separate them out. 
and burn the tares with unquenchable fire. I hope you're not a tear. So Jesus gave a command to his faithful remnant, five different commands, not to a dead church of we think we are saved hypocrites, but here are the five commands. Number one, wake up. Don't let that apathy of the rest of the church lull you into the sleep of death. Number two, strengthen that which remains. In other words, the fire is going out. You need to put more wood on the fire and fan the flames to make the fire brighter in the scary dark night of the jungle. That's why you need to be here. Number three, this is a call to go back what they already knew, what they had seen and heard. He tells them, remember. And then he tells them to keep. In other words, faithfully obey what you know and remember. And finally, he tells them to repent. There is no revival without repentance. Repentance is not say, oh yeah, I'm sorry about that, or I feel sorry about that. Repentance, metanoia, is the word that makes, means 180 degree about face. You're walking south, and you're walking along briskly, and you turn around, and you not merely face north, but you begin to walk as briskly north or faster than you were walking south. That's metanoia. That means to turn about your direction and begin to run as fast as you can in the correct direction. There are five principles, and when you put them into practice, the few can bring revival to a church, and we need revival here. Not lazy dead sloths. Even if lazy dead sloths get benefit from this church, that's not the standard that God sets, that the Lord Jesus Christ sets in his word. You need to be here and you need to be active. Okay, tonight, the church at Philadelphia. By the way, Jesus makes it very clear that he will destroy all the dead churches where there is no revival, and he'll destroy this church here if there's no revival too. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So tonight, we're in Revelation 3, verses 7 through 13. As we look at this passage here, we just read it, those studying the book of Revelation have called Philadelphia of Asia Minor, the faithful church and the missionary church. In church history, and remember we paralleled this to different periods of church history in our opening lessons on the book of Revelation. In church history, it appears to most closely parallel the time period from the Great Awakening here in America through the beginning of the 1960s, 1960-61, somewhere along in there, when the church in America took a definite turn toward the character qualities of the church at Laodicea. We'll talk about that more when we get to Laodicea, but we see some of the definite character qualities of the church at Laodicea beginning to hit America with full force in the 1960s. Only two of the seven churches have no rebuke from Jesus recorded against them. The church at Smyrna, which was the persecuted church, the suffering church, and the church at Philadelphia. The name in itself tells you something about the church. Philadelphia is a compound of two Greek words, philos and adelphos. Philos is a friendship kind of love. Adelphos means brother. Living across the river from the American city of Philadelphia, I'm sure that you all know that Philadelphia has been called the city of brotherly love. And of course, you're all familiar with Love Park and the iconic statue of the word love, which was moved not too long ago for the complete renovation of that park. The history of the church in Philadelphia of Asia Minor is almost as long as the history of the church in Smyrna. As we noted when we studied Smyrna, where Polycarp was martyred, there are still over 100,000 people there today that self-identify as Christians, even in the midst of Muslim persecution. Philadelphia went through many attacks like that. They were not extinguished until the Muslim conquests in 1400 and after. The faithful church. The Muslims came in and wiped it out. It may tell us something about what will happen here in America. I hope we can talk about that later on. 
The Philadelphia of Asia Minor was not far from Smyrna, which was a good church. It was about 30 miles from Sardis, the bad church. It was in the smaller Kogamas River Valley, which ascends up to a central plateau of about 2,500 feet. In that valley stands a hill 800 feet high, and it was on top of that hill where Philadelphia was built. According to various commentators, it was known as the Gateway to the East because it was the point that Greek culture, that is the Hellenistic culture, was spread to the entire region and the Greek language as well, so that all the local languages were eventually extinguished. Philadelphia is also the newest city of the seven cities mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3, because it was not founded until about 189 BC. So it's only about 200 years old at the time that John writes the book of Revelation. It was probably founded by one of the kings of Pergamon, and we studied Pergamon and all the horrible things that happened there at Pergamon. It was probably either founded by Eumenes or his brother Attalus II, and hence it got the name Brother Lover, because they were known for their loyalty and love for one another. One problem, however, with building the city at that location was that it was along a fault line that had various volcanoes that suffered destruction in 17 AD due to a gigantic earthquake. You know, as you look at the history of the city, it, it may tell you something else about the history of the church. I, I don't want to go too far afield on this, but you know, there are earthquakes coming against the church here in America right now. The judicial earthquakes and political earthquakes and all kinds of other things like that. And by the way, be in prayer for President Trump right now, this afternoon, uh, he and Kim Jong-un both arrived in Singapore, so they're both there right now for this so-called upcoming summit. There are all kinds of earthquakes going on that may affect the church. And be in prayer for our brothers and sisters in Christ who currently are in North Korea. We prayed for them this morning. But anyway, it was along a fault line, and it was destroyed in 17 AD due to a giant earthquake. Tiberius Caesar sent disaster relief, that's what we call it today, to rebuild the city, and so it changed its name to Neo Caesarea for several years. Later, it changed its name again to Flavia to honor the Roman imperial family. Now, most of the other churches in chapter 2 and 3 reflect the specific character qualities of the Son of Man vision described in chapter 1. And do you remember how it talks about him girded in a white girdle and a, a white robe and golden girdle and you know he's got stars in one hand and uh, all kinds of things are going on, brazen feet. Uh, as you look at the various references to the other churches, you find that there are reflections of the way in which the Lord Jesus is portrayed in the Son of Man vision. But as we look here at Philadelphia, it's somewhat different. Philadelphia, when Jesus is talking to Philadelphia, he describes himself with five different character qualities. And the five qualities that he uses to describe himself are character qualities of Christ that are expressive of his messianic character as described in the prophetic Old Testament, especially in the book of Isaiah. We'll see that in just a moment. First, he who is holy. The one who speaks here is he who is holy. You know, I did many, many, many years ago, I did a study on the holiness of God. And after doing that study, I was deeply impressed that holiness is perhaps the most important key description of God in the Old Testament. The holiness of God is also one of the most fascinating studies in all of Scripture. I encourage you to take your concordances and look at all the places that holy occurs. Meditate on those passages. Think about the holiness of God. After going through the passages dealing with the holiness of God, you will want to fall at his feet in total worship if you are an in-fellowship believer. If you study the passages dealing with the holiness of God and you are not a believer, you will also want to fall at his feet in abject terror. Holiness cannot tolerate even the smallest sin. 
You think you have some little sins and they're not important. You don't understand the holiness of God. You cannot understand the filthy vileness of your own sin until you begin to get a glimpse of the holiness of God. I should also add that carnal Christians who think that they can continue in sin because of grace do not understand either grace or holiness. And Paul makes a point of that. What? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If you think you can continue in sin because of grace, you do not understand either grace or holiness. Carnal Christians who think that way are in for a huge surprise when the chastening hand of God grabs them by the scruff of the neck and dangles them over the flames of discipline of the thing they fear most. You know, God does that in discipline. Ask yourself this question. What do you fear most? Think about it for a minute. What do you fear most? You see, if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you're going to fear something else. If the fear of the Lord is not number one in your life, you're going to fear something else number one. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the holy is understanding. If that's not number one in your life, the fear of the Lord, that means something else is number one in terms of what you fear. What do you fear most? Did you know that's probably what God will use to discipline you with chastening before he kills you with death for refusing to repent? Holiness. When the angels surround the throne of Jehovah in Isaiah 6, the ascription of worship and praise that they give to him is holy, holy, Holy is the Lord God of hosts. No other word in the Bible is used in triplicate to describe the character of God. When you're in the presence of God, the one overriding characteristic that overshadows all the other character qualities of God is His holiness. That's the first thing that Jesus uses to describe himself in the letter to the church at Philadelphia. Although the other character qualities of God are true, you never see the angel saying, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful is the Lord God of hosts. You never see them saying, love, love, love is the Lord God of hosts. You never see them saying, gracious, 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 or merciful, 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 or omnipotent, 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 or omnipresent, omnipresent, omnipresent is the Lord God of hosts. Or, and here we need to pay attention because we're Presbyterians, sovereign, sovereign, sovereign is the Lord God of hosts. We tend to make that the central character quality of God. That's true about God, as are all the other ones. But that's not the controlling character quality of God. You don't find any of the other of the infinite number of character qualities describing his perfection repeated in triplicate by anyone who worships before him. Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Now Jesus tells us in John chapter 12, that Isaiah saw Jesus and said this about him. So the one before whom they fall, and they call him holy, 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 that one is Jesus, according to John chapter 12. And that's the character quality that Jesus gives to himself as he speaks to the church of Philadelphia. The first character quality is he who is holy. Above it stood the seraphim, that's the burning ones, seraph, to burn. 
Each one had six wings, with twenty covered his face, with twenty covered his feet, with twenty did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, all capitals, Jehovah Jesus, Yahweh Sabaoth, Jehovah Jesus. The Lord is full of His glory. We have a manifestation of the Shekinah glory. And what is the central character quality of the manifestation of the Shekinah glory? It is the holiness of Jesus on His throne. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of Him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. What does it do to Isaiah when he sees the holiness of God? Then said I, what is me? For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Now this is already in chapter 6. This is already after Isaiah has begun to proclaim the word of God in chapters 1 through 5. Isaiah is already a useful vessel to God. Isaiah is walking in fellowship. Isaiah is walking by faith. Isaiah is walking in obedience. But when he gets a glimpse of the holiness of God, he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. The seraphim notice he's there. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth. Imagine opening your mouth and having somebody put a burning coal in your mouth. He laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. The cleansing of the mouth for proclamation of the word. Did you get that? The cleansing of the mouth for the proclamation of the word. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? There's the Trinity. Jesus is the Lord sitting on the throne. John 12 says so. But we have the Trinity, for it's in the plural. He will, then said I, here am I, send me. That's the key to this passage. When we see God in his holiness, it makes us want to do at least three things. Write them down. When you understand the holiness of God, when you see God in his holiness, it makes you want to do at least three things. Number one, cry out because of your own uncleanness and beg for cleansing. That's what happened with Isaiah. Number two, worship him in the beauty of holiness. That's an incredible phrase in scripture that refers to holy clothing. Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 use it. It's a very, very interesting phrase. Holy clothing, holy festive garments. The, the beautiful white clothing that was worn at the feasts of Israel, worn by the priests as they went in for worship. Ties us back with how Jesus said, I'll give you white clothing if you overcome. The holy clothing of Psalm 2 and 10. And as we've said before, that business of holy clothing seems to be something that many have ignored in the modern American church. The third thing that the holiness of God, when you really begin to understand it, the third thing that it makes you do is ask for the privilege of serving him wherever he will send you. After Isaiah saw the holiness of God, he cried out because of his uncleanness. He worshiped God, and he asked for the privilege of serving. Here am I. Send me. Now, the next few things that I want to say here, I hope 
You pay attention because it will help you when you're talking to people who want to criticize God, who always have an excuse for why they don't believe in God. When wicked pagans criticize God and try to portray God apart from his holiness, because they always use some other character quality, how can a God of love do blah, 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 you know? When they portray God apart from his holiness, they do not portray the God of the Bible. When carnal Christians downplay the holiness of God and try to make his love or his mercy or his grace the principal character quality so that they can excuse their own carnality, they put themselves in grave danger. When they say, as I mentioned a moment ago, well, you know, God's a God of love. And, and a God of love wants me to be happy. What they're doing is putting their own desire above the holiness of God. He wants me to be happy, so he wants me to have this, so he wants me to have that. God wants me to be happy. That is not the controlling character quality of God, that God wants you to be happy. Now, I know that may come as a shock to some of you, but you know, frankly, God doesn't care whether or not you're happy. Happiness goes back to the word hap, which means luck. Happenstance, things that happen. God wants you to be filled with joy, which is not the same thing as happiness. And joy is the fruit of the Spirit. And joy can take place even in the darkest times of trouble and tribulation. I was talking to somebody this week, and, you know, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. I don't want this. I don't want that. I don't want this. I want to be happy. Wrong perspective on life. If you understand the holiness of God, and if that is the God upon whom you focus, your desire is not for your own personal happiness, your desire is for holiness. Your desire is to depart from sin. Your desire is to live for Christ, regardless of the cost. That's the first word that Jesus gives to the church at Philadelphia. When some carnal Christian says, well, a loving God would never do such and such, they do not understand either divine love or divine holiness. If you're taking notes, and I hope you are, write this one down. The character quality that provides the framework for all of God's other character qualities is his holiness. Let me say it again. The character quality that provides the framework for all of God's other character qualities is his holiness. Here's another one to write down. You cannot fully understand any of the other character qualities of God apart from the holiness of God. Let me say it again. You cannot fully understand any of the other character qualities of God apart from the holiness of God. It's the framework. It's what gives meaning and understanding to all the other character qualities of God. A lot of people like to push against holiness and call holiness legalism. But if you call holiness legalism, you impugn the central character quality by which God has principally revealed himself in the Bible. Holiness is not legalism. For the believer, reflecting the central character quality of God is not legalism. You want to be holy. In fact, you are commanded to be holy. Be ye holy... For I, the Lord your God, am holy. It's not an option. It's a command. It's stated in the Old Testament. It is repeated in the New Testament. Be ye holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. Holiness is not legalism. 
Holiness deals with moral purity and with separation from all forms and all levels. Get it? All forms and all levels, little or big, deals with all forms and all levels of sin. You can't even define sin without the holiness of God. Biblically speaking, sin can only be defined as that which stands in contradiction to the holiness of God himself. It is the holiness of God that alone gives us a definition of sin. Without the holiness of God, there would be no absolute standards for determining what sin is and what sin is not. What is the standard for sin? It goes to the very heart character quality of God, which is his holiness. Without the holiness of God, we are left with a stinky, messy, irrational standard of situational ethics. We'll end up just like Israel did at the end of the book of Judges, when every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Do you understand that this is why and is precisely why pagans and compromising Christians want to make a different or another of the ineffable character qualities of God central and controlling qualities like his love or his mercy or his grace. They want to make any other character quality of God central rather than his holiness. Why? Because that way they don't have an absolute standard against which they will be judged. Note this well. Holiness is never portrayed in light of or a subservient to any other of God's character qualities. All of God's other character qualities must be seen in light of his holiness. Let me give you an illustration. For example, you see, without holiness, there's no need for grace. You can't make grace the center. But, because grace is for what? Grace is extended to us as we are guilty for sin. What is it that defines sin? It's the holiness of God that defines sin. Without holiness, there is no need for grace. But you cannot say, without grace, there's no need for holiness. That doesn't work. Holiness is not legalism. Holiness is a reflection of the central controlling character quality of God. And God says to us in command, Be ye holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You know, we've discussed the four different types of legalism in the Bible, and I've preached on it extensively, so I'll not do that again, but I'll just remind you of them, what legalism is, because a lot of people try to make holiness legalism. They say holiness is legalism. The four kinds are Jewish apostate legalism, that is requiring a work of Old Testament law for salvation, pagan apostate legalism, which requires a human good work of man for salvation, Jewish heretical legalism, which requires a work of Old Testament law for sanctification, and pagan heretical legalism, which requires a human good work of man for sanctification. But let me say it again. Holiness is not legalism. Never let anybody redefine either legalism or holiness for you. If they can get you thinking something else is legalism, they've managed to knock you off the center pin, which is holiness of God. Holiness is a reflection of the central controlling character quality of God. Reflecting the central controlling character quality of God is what we are called upon to do. We are to be conformed to the image of Christ. Jesus is holy, and that's the first thing he says to the church at Philadelphia. He who is holy. Being conformed to the image of Christ is, in fact, what we do. God does it in us. The entire biblical doctrine of separation is based on the character quality of the holiness of God. Do you understand that? There is no purpose, no meaning to separation except your own good feelings about what you like and what you don't like unless you have the holiness of God. 
Separation makes no sense at all, and that's why most of the evangelical so-called church in America today doesn't practice any form of separation and dresses like they do when they come to worship before a holy God and don't understand what holiness is. Because they've redefined some other one of God's character qualities as, as the number one. The Bible puts holiness first. Let me read you just a few verses where Jehovah God takes the title, the Holy One, and that's the title that Jesus gives of himself in the Gospels and in the book of Revelation. It's a title that clearly belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore it is a very clear manifestation of his sovereign deity. Let me just read you a few passages. 2 Kings 19.22 whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high? Even against the Holy One of Israel. How about Job 6, verse 10? Then should I yet have comfort, yea, I would harden myself in sorrow, let him not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. Job. Psalm 16, 10. Now you know this verse because this is a verse that relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a prophetic verse about his resurrection. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Jesus, the resurrected Christ, we see him that way. The lamb that was slain and yet standing as we look at the opening verses of Revelation. The one who introduces himself here in chapter 3 as the Holy One. Psalm 71, verse 22. I will also praise thee with the psaltery, even thy truth, O my God. Unto thee will I sing with the harp, O thou Holy One of Israel. Psalm 78 dealing with Israel's rebellion. They turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Psalm 89, 18. For the Lord, Jehovah, is our defense and the Holy One of Israel is our king. <laughs> Palm Sunday it takes you to. Psalm 89, 19. Then thou spakest in vision to thy Holy One and saidst, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. Did you know the Holy One is one of Isaiah the prophet's favorite titles for the Lord Jesus Christ? The Holy One is one of the favorite titles that God uses of himself in the prophetic passages in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 1.4, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, that they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Chapter 5, 19, they say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. Verse 24, therefore as the fire devoureth the stubble, the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Chapter 10, verse 17, the light of Israel shall be for fire and his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. That's Jesus in Revelation 19. We'll get there. Isaiah 10, 20, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped to the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the holy one of Israel in truth. That brings us to the book of Revelation chapter 19 and 20. Isaiah 12, 6, Cry and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Jesus ruling in Jerusalem. Chapter 17, verse 7, At that day a man looked to his maker, and his eyes shall have respect unto the Holy One of Israel. Chapter 29, 19, The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. 29, 23, But when he seeth his children the work of mine hands in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. 
Chapter 30, verse 11, get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path because the Holy One of Israel caused the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because you despise his word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon, he sends judgment. Chapter 30, verse 15, for thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But ye would not. And ye would not. Chapter 31, 1. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. You know, America's going that way, folks. We want to develop our military might, but we don't want to trust in God. There's a whole movement out there to take away the motto of the United States, in God we trust. Get it off our money. They've already knocked out the Ten Commandments from the public schools. They've already knocked prayer out of the schools. They're doing their very best to confine Bible teaching to the four walls of the church and not have anything up. I mean, Facebook removing a lot of stuff that would be offensive to pagans. <clears throat> they call what we preach hate speech. They go to Southern Poverty Law Center which is determined to get rid of everything moral in the United States and replace it with the most grotesque immorality. They label churches like this as hate groups. Why did Israel fall? Because they trusted in their military might and in their skills, their talents, their abilities. Israel's going to do that, you know, just before they get wiped out in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and they come under the oppression of the Great Tribulation period. They're warned about it here. Don't go down to Egypt for help. Don't go to the world for help. Look to the Holy One of Israel. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed against? Whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? To whom then will liken me, or will shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Fear not, thou warm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The Redeemer is Jesus. Isaiah 41, 16. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. Chapter 41, 20. That they may see, and know, and consider, and understand that the hand of the Lord hath done this, and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. I hope you're getting the idea. I can't believe our time is already gone. I have another whole page of quotes from Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea. And that's even before we get into the New Testament. Got a couple in Habakkuk. Then we got Mark and Luke and Acts and 1 John and Revelation. And that's just the first term by which Jesus defines himself in the letter to the church of Philadelphia. The other four terms, as you know, are he who is true. Oh, how much is in that one? And that's the way he introduces himself to that church. He who has the key of David. Now that is a fantastic messianic term. He who opens and no man shuts. We get into some of his sovereignty and power there. He can open a door and nobody can push it closed. Oh, that he would do that for us here in Collingswood. I hope you pray for that. We'll talk more about it when we get there. And then the final of the five, he who shuts and no man opens. I pray that he will not do that to us. For nothing will work at that point. No amount of beating on doors, drumming down the street, holding special events, running summer Bible school, advertising, internet and website broadcasting. If Jesus shuts the door, no man can open it. The church at Philadelphia. It was a good church. Nothing evil said about it. 
No words of chastisement or rebuke. Like Smyrna, but it wasn't persecuted like Smyrna. And eventually, it was wiped out. The believers there were martyred and killed by Muslims. What will happen to us here in America? Only God knows. But meanwhile, we have a responsibility. And number one is to recognize that we serve a God, a Lord, who is holy. And he's called us to be holy. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your holiness. How we thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ is holy. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is the Lord who is high and lifted up and his train fills the temple and before whom the seraphim bow and cry day and night without ceasing. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the pillars of the temple shake. It's filled with smoke of the Shekinah. And those who see his holiness fall before him and cry, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Cleanse our lips and our mouths with a coal from the altar. And let us cry as did Isaiah, Here am I, Lord, send me. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.